Amen to that, right? You got it. We're not going to pass any offering plates. If you want to give, there's our offering box back there. We're just do, we're going to do that for a while. And uh, this month of May, <clears throat> we're trying to um, honor uh, some of the great women of faith in the Scriptures. And this, this morning, I'd like to invite you to uh, a book in the Old Testament. And um, I want to say something. As uh, You got your Bible there. Go ahead and turn to the first chapter of the book of Ruth. Joshua, Judges, Ruth. And it's really hard to just share one particular place in the book of Ruth because the, the book is just a beautiful, beautiful uh, story. And But we're going to just focus on one particular thing this morning. So I'm going to invite you to Ruth chapter 1. And the two verses that I want to focus on are verses 16 and 17. Ruth 1, 16 and 17. Amen. Are y'all there with me? Amen. Ruth is speaking to her mother-in-law, and we're going to give you sort of the context in a minute in which this is said, but I just want to read these two verses. Uh, <clears throat> Ruth says to Naomi, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For where you go, I will go. Where you live or lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also... If aught or anything but death part thee and me. Wow. You know, if you were to ask me, <clears throat> what is a Christian? What is a disciple? I would say, turn to Ruth chapter 1 and read verses 16 and 17. Because I don't think there's a greater definition of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ than what Ruth just stated. That declaration of faith was an amazing statement. You know, I know that I'm a Christian. I mean, I know that Jesus is my Savior and my Lord. And I know according to the Word of God, because Jesus is my Savior, that I'm going to heaven someday when I leave this world. I know that. I know that God called me to preach and I've tried to serve Him. But I want to tell you something. I will never in my life feel that I've been a real disciple of Jesus Christ. Because of this. Because Jesus says, if you love anything or anybody more than me, you're not worthy to be my disciple. Now you say, that's a high standard, but he's a, he's a great Savior. Amen? Amen? And Ruth just sort of challenges me and puts me in my place that, that she was willing to forsake family, friends, gods, everything to go into this strange place and take up the true and living God. That is a fantastic statement. Ruth was a Gentile. Her God was, she, they had plenty of gods, but her main God was Chemosh. And at Chemosh, many times, beautiful little babies, beautiful children were offered as human sacrifices to Chemosh. That's where she came from. And friends, by the grace of God, she left Moab. Do you know she became the great-grandmother of King David? Did you know that? If you read the book of Ruth at the end, she became the great-grandmother of King David. So here's this just fantastic story. 
Now, here's what I want to do this morning, and I want you to just, you know, stay with me because I'm going to tell you something. Every one of us are in this little narrative that I'm going to talk about this morning, and we need to find out where we are with the Lord. Amen. Don't you think it would be good this morning just to do a little evaluation and a check in our own hearts and in our own lives? And where am I with the Lord? You know, how close to the Lord am I? Maybe you're here today and there was a time in your life you were closer to the Lord. You were walking tighter and closer with Jesus in true fellowship. But maybe that's not the truth today. I want to I just preach this text. Now, in verse 16 and 17, let me just say this. This is a turning point in, in the whole narrative, okay? Everything, because you see, Ruth begins with a funeral and ends with a wedding. It begins with weeping and ends with worship and rejoicing. It begins with bitterness, but it ends with God's blessings and joy and revival in these people's hearts that's what, that, listen, listen, that's what happens when you make the choice Ruth made. When, when you decide for Christ, when you decide all in all out for Christ, He turns your valleys into victories. That's because He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. 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 And so church, that's what happens in the book of Ruth. And it all turns around when she makes this declaration of faith. Now, um, she says, now you've got to pick up here at verse number 16. She basically says there's five things. And when she says to Naomi, entreat me not to leave you or return from following you. And I want to touch on that in just a minute. But she lists five things and she says, your destiny is my destiny. Your descendants are my descendants. Your dwelling is my dwelling. Your God is my God and where you die, I'll die. Friend, I'm going to tell you what. And she even sealed that by saying, if I, if I don't live up to this, just let God take me out of the world. Mm -hmm. Till death do us part is what she said. This is, this is so classic. I, I wish I could express in language what it is to really be a Christian. To really be a follower of Jesus Christ. And what I want to do, and I want you to follow with me this morning, okay? What I want us to do, I want us to look at Ruth's choice and contrast it with three other choices that are made in this chapter. Okay? Okay? Now, I want you to go back with me to verse number 1. And there's a gentleman here, a father and a husband. His name is Elimelech. And I want to read verses 1 through 3. Now, it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. That's the book of Judges. Dark days. Disobedient days. There was a famine in the land. A certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. Now, by the way, the word sojourn means just for a little while, temporarily. He took his wife and two sons. This man's name was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And by the way, Elimelech, his name means God is my king. Naomi's name means pleasant and joyful. The name of his two sons, Milan and Chilion, they're, both of their names means uh, is reference to sickly, and they die young. They were Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. Bethlehem, the word means house of bread. Judah means praise. They came to the country of Moab and continued there. Did you notice that? Notice in verse 1, they were just going to go there for a little while. At the end of verse 2, they end up living there. Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. And in verse 5, they died. 
in about a 10 year span. Now I want to I want to contrast first of all Ruth's choice with Elimelech. Elimelech had a great life. I mean, he had friends, he had family. He had, he had the temple. He had the presence of God. He lived in the most uh, uh, the place in the world where God was at. He literally lived in God's country. Uh, from the tribe that he came from, he was probably well off financially. And had, I mean, this guy was just, everything was going great. And he was in God's land. Now listen to me, friends. To be in the land... Meant to be in God's will. Because God said, I give you this land. And this is my land where I'm going to bless you. If you go outside this land and you go to foreign places with pagans and their gods, you're going to lose my blessing. And so here's this man in the will of God, in the land. And I'm going to tell you something. I do not know, I don't want to be mean, I don't want to pick on him, but we have to take the Bible as the Spirit wrote it. I do not know what caused this man who had such a great life that when a little trouble came, he turned his back on God. He not only turned his back on God, but he made a parental fatherly choice. And that choice cost him probably his life and in a pagan country, there him and his two boys were buried outside of the land. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it was fear. I mean, if, if, if there's famine in the land, and there's no wheat crop growing, and it's just a little uh, dry spell, and man, there's not a lot of money in the bank. I don't know if it was fear that caused him to leave God's land and go to the enemy's land. I don't know. Maybe it was money and materialism. You know, there's nothing hidden that all of his friends and family all packed up to Moab. Maybe him and his wife, I don't know, maybe they were just the kind of people that were high society and high maintenance and, and Mo they heard about the good stuff in Moab. I don't know. I don't know what would cause you to pack up and leave your home and take your kids to a place where you know God is not. <coughs> he didn't have a chance to make it right. We don't find Elimelech coming back home. We find Naomi coming back home. And you know, maybe you're here today. You know, there's a. You know, I'm going to tell you something. The father's choices determine the destiny of their family. And it's a big deal. Amen? There's a lot of fathers whose kids are so far away from God today because in their younger years it was more about money and materialism. Get all you can, can all you get. We'll settle down and go to church one day. You might not get that chance. But I want to tell you something. There's a the, uh, Elimelech's choice if you contrast it with Ruth Ruth was willing to leave her false gods, her paganistic sinful society, even her family that worshiped false gods. She was willing to leave that and go to God's land. And this guy who says, my God is my king, was willing to turn his back on everything. Yeah. Wow. Ruth shames Elimelech. You know, our choices as parents matter. Somebody said we individually are the sum total of our choices, and that's true. But also at the same time, there are people who are under our wings, who their, their life right now is based, and I want to tell you something. My, listen, now, I, I've just got to say this. Um, I don't have any notes. My heart break. Parenting is hard work. Okay? So my heart goes out to a lot of parents. But you can't sympathize with parents. Oh my goodness, y'all. Just this stuff's coming here. And I, this is tough. I mean, or y'all, I know we should be celebrating. But I, um, oh my goodness. 
there's a lot of kids unsaved who are now adults who care nothing for God, nothing for church, because the parents were more interested in enjoying the pleasures and luxuries of this world instead of making good parental decisions that their child would hear the good news of Jesus Christ and be saved and have something to look forward to when they leave this world. Yeah. Amen. 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 And a lot of those parents were churchgoers. I knew, a, I knew a family, and I'm not picking on them. I told you parenting's hard. I'm just trying to give an example. I knew a family. They, they sung every weeknight was practice singing. Every weekend they were gone forever singing and left their children at home pretty much to grow up by themselves. Children who rebelled against everything mom and daddy was singing about. Yeah. Some churches today, and yeah, I'm, I'm getting a little peaky, but some, we think as churches, the busier we are, the more spiritual we are. we got some Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and we've burned families out. That You know what? I was, I was criticized because when we started New Life, we eliminated Sunday night. Daphne and I, in our experience, we felt like today, uh, you take a young couple and both of them's working, and they're busy all week and maybe trying to raise kids. Man, Sunday evening is just good for family time together a lot of times before they head out again and don't see each other much. Yeah. And I got criticized for that. Because you know what? The very churches that will say we support family will just burn them out yeah. with church activities. And if you don't show up for a church activity, God forbid, you're just out of fellowship with the Lord. <laughs> huh? I know how it is. But I want to tell you something, friend. I, I know there's no perfect father there's no perfect mother. But you have to give your hats off and applaud any mother or father that tried sincerely to do what's right and lead their kids and point them to the cross and point them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Poor eliminate. Look, Bethlehem, Judah, the house of bread and the house of praise, and he goes down to Moab. Is that you before we go on to Naomi? You know what? Anybody in this room, and don't raise your hand because I know it's a rhetorical question. The answer's already given. You got any parental regrets? Yeah, we do, don't we? But you know what? For those of us, unlike a Lemonette, who didn't have a chance to make things right, you know, we, we appreciate the Lord who gives us time and grace to make things right in life. Amen? Mm -hmm. You know, I had a dad, and I preached his funeral. Some of you would know him. And, oh my goodness, he said something to me one time, and I will never forget it if I live to be a thousand. This dad had to take his son to court to get the kids. Because his son had become an alcoholic and was dangerous. And this father, as I said, went to court and got the kids so they would have a home. Years later, this father started attending my church. And he told me one day, oh my goodness, and tears were rolling down his cheek when he was telling me. Here's what he said. He told me this story that I just told you. And then he said this. I gave him his first drink. Wow. I couldn't say nothing. Because you see, this stupid parental idiot, idi idiocy. Well, let them drink at home when they're safe. I can watch over them. Do you realize an alcoholic needs just one drink to set it off? Do you realize one drug addict just needs one smoke? Some people can take a drink. I took a drink of beer, but I, you know, I, I thought it tasted crappy. <laughs> you know, I never acquired a taste for it. But you take an alcoholic, and you put it in front of them, it's different. There's people who smoke pot, 
never even thought about it anymore. But the drug addict took a smoke and was hooked for life and led to other things. So I'm going to tell you something. When we as parents make choices, we need to just stay in the will of God the best we can. Amen? Amen. And let me tell you something. When you're going to, famines are going to come. Let me, can I say something else right here? Y'all in a big hurry today. Um, listen. Just because there's a famine, Elimelech, don't go down to Moab. God will send rain and sunshine again. Hasn't He always, church? Huh? You know, you say, well, you know, my marriage relationship, we're, there's a little famine right now, and affections ain't high, and so on. Oh, so you're going to run down to Moab? Well, my church, you know, we got some good people and just love the Lord, but we're just not, you know, we're going through a dry spell, so you're going to run down to Moab? So every little, every little hard time and difficulty in life, and if you notice people who just run from this to this to this to this, always looking for the answer, let me tell you, as a Christian, you're going to go through dry spells. You're going to have times in your life when it's just not super spiritual. But listen, that's not the time to leave the Lord. That's the time to just stick your feet in and dig in a little bit, just like this virus that's going on in our world. Come on, friend. This is not the time to turn our backs on the Lord. Amen. This is the time to look unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith. And I'm going to tell you what, if something like this will, will just shut me down and put me in depression and life ain't worth living, I wasn't very much to begin with, Jim. Are we serving a God just on the mountain when things are well? Or are we going to praise Him in the valley when all of hell is coming against us? Amen? Amen. That's what Ruth said. Ruth said, let God kill me. Here's my declaration of the very opposite of this man who said, my God. Let me show you another way. Here's a second choice. And, and uh, we'll move a little quicker here. I just There's a lot of verses to cover, but I want to pick up at verse number 6. And I want to contrast Ruth's choice now with the mother, Naomi. Whose name means pleasant and joyful. But I want to tell you something. You wouldn't want to live with Naomi very long. She was a bitter, bitter lady. Matter of fact, she even said in verse 20, Don't even call me Naomi. Far, far away. Change my name to Mara. I'm a bitter lady. <laughs> I'm going through a lot, I think. Maybe she didn't want to leave Bethlehem to start with. Maybe she went joyfully with her husband. We don't know. We don't want to condemn her. But we know that she lost her husband. She lost her boys. Now, you know what? If you think times are hard, just take a minute and put yourself in Naomi's shoes. And in a in a less than a ten year span, you bury your husband and two boys in a cemetery in a God forsaken country, and you're left with two Moabite daughter in laws. And you know what she tells them? Now listen, I'm, I'm setting you up because I want you to understand where she's coming from. She tells her two daughter-in-law, so she heads back to Bethlehem because she heard God is giving plenty now. Verse 8 is a better verse. Naomi says to her two daughters-in-law, Go and return to your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you've dealt with the dead and with me. Verse 11, Naomi says again, Turn, my daughters, why will you go with me? Are there any more sons in my womb? See, she's being so bitter and sarcastic. Verse 12. Turn again. She's basically saying, leave, my daughters. Go your way. I'm too old to have a husband. And she says this more than once. And I want you to understand where Naomi is. Now listen to me carefully. I've not buried a spouse and two siblings. Two children. And so I'm not going to condemn this woman in no way. Because a lot of times until we wore somebody's shoes, we don't know what's going on in their life. But I will tell you this, she allowed a root of bitterness to take root in her spirit. And she lost, are you hearing me? She lost 
Her compassion. See, she wasn't even thinking spiritual anymore because she, her two daughter-in-laws, she was encouraging them to go back to a place where God wasn't. Mm. To false gods. To a place of no hope and no future and no blessings when she should have been pleading with them. My daughters, go with me. God is there. He's given rain and sunshine and crops again. He's a true and living God. She didn't plead with Him whatsoever. She just kept saying, go back. I want to tell you, one of the greatest signs that a Christian is out of fellowship with God. I think it's the telltale sign of how I know if I'm out of fellowship with my Lord. Do you know one of the, if not the first thing you wanted to do when you got saved? Was tell somebody. Yep. Let me tell you something. When you are close to the Lord, you want to see people you love saved. You can condemn the old timers all you want, you can make fun of their hellfire and brimstone sermons. You can ridicule them on some of their old traditions and they had some that were just, you know, pathetic. But one thing you can't condemn them for. And I thank my God that I had the privilege as a human being to grow up. You can't condemn them for not caring about our soul. Some of you got a mom and a daddy and a grandma and a grandpa who prayed earnestly for your salvation. Amen? Amen? Let me tell you, when you don't care whether people die and go to hell, you're out of fellowship with God. Me too. And Naomi had got so bitter, she didn't care about people's soul. It's a back door lock. You know, bitterness is a horrible thing. She said, just call me bitter. If you contrast her with Ruth, now listen to me. I have to, I have to applaud Naomi because she was willing to go back home. Amen? I mean, despite what she was suffering, despite her bitterness, despite it all, Man, man, have, have you ever uh, been like me in the past when I was out of fellowship with God as a teenager and I, I didn't live anything that looked like the Christian life? I know that I was saved. And I'll tell you what, I had stuff in my life. If you would have saw me and heard me, you'd say, that boy ain't no Christian. And I knew I was a mess. But I'm going to tell you something. This is hard to explain, Chad. Hard to explain. But deep down, somewhere down there was still the voice of the Lord. Yeah. And I look at Naomi and all her suffering and her bitterness and her pain and, and she seems to be mad at God in the world. But I look deep down, she still wants to get back home. She still wants to get back to Bethlehem. A place of bread and a place of praise. And I applaud her for that. Glory to God. Because there's a lot of people today who care nothing about God's house, God's will, God's glory, God's word, God's people. But Naomi had the heart and still enough spirituality to get her back home. Hallelujah. Yeah. And I want to tell you, in all of her weakness and that decision she made had an influence on her daughter-in-law, Ruth. Because if you notice in Ruth's declaration of faith, she said, I want to go where you go. I want your people to be mine. I want your God to be my God. Let me tell you, you're really being a good parent when your child wants to grow up and have daddy's God and mama's God. Amen. Amen. So I just applaud Naomi. And you know what? I want to go a little further here. There's a lot of people who hate Christians. Oh, I ain't going to church. There's so many hypocrites and people just da 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 da. You know what? I'll invite anybody in this room to inspect us all and you're going to find some junk. Because ain't nobody in this room perfect. No. 
But I want to tell you something. I believe there's some folks in this room deep down in their heart like Naomi. We want to try our best by the grace of God to do what's right and do the will of the Lord. Amen, church. Hallelujah. Maybe that's you. Maybe you had a bad relationship with your spouse. Maybe somebody said something that hurts you and just cuts you deep and you've been bitter ever since. All i got to do is mention their name and you're going... Mm. Mm -hmm. You know what? Bitterness will take it pleasantness and joy right out of your life and make you a miserable person. And I want to tell you something, friends. We've got to be strong in the Lord and not allow what people do and what people say to get inside our spirit and make us just like this old sick, depressed world that we live in today. Amen? Amen. And if you contrast, you say, well, Brother Bobby, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I've faced. You're being harsh. I'm going to tell you something. Yeah, Naomi had some hard times, but don't forget, her daughter-in-law buried a father-in-law and buried a husband too. And don't forget, Ruth knew what pain was also. And that Ruth was willing to leave her father, mother, sister, brother, gods, and everything else. So let me tell you, in the end, Ruth, this great woman, challenges us once again and say, I don't know, you've been through difficult times. So have I, but I'm clinging to the Lord. The last one I want to give you is, is in verse 4. Her first name is mentioned as Orpah. The other daughter-in-law. That's when her name is first mentioned in, in comparison with Ruth. And I want you to know that Orpah's choice contrasted with Ruth's in verse 14. So when Naomi says, ladies, y'all just go back home, Orpah does the Judas thing. I'm not saying she didn't have affection for her mother-in-law. I believe with all my heart she had great feelings for Naomi. And so I'm not going to beat her up. But the word Orpah means a fleeing gazelle. It's used figuratively of the word apostasy. And Orpah is that lady who kissed her mother-in-law on the cheek and said this. Listen to me. Uh, I know she loved Naomi, but let me tell you, there's nothing in her spirit wanting Naomi's God. There's nothing in her spirit wanting Naomi's people. She gladly said goodbye mother-in-law and went back to Kamash and the gods of Moab and the people of Moab and you never saw her again perishing in a pagan country. She kissed. Somebody said Judas Iscariot who kissed the Lord and forsook Him. Judas kissed heaven's door and went to hell. Oh my goodness, how many people, and this just scares the socks off me, but I can't do anything about it. How many people have attended church for a little while and had feelings for Jesus? And if, if you say, do you love Jesus? Oh, I love Jesus. He died on the cross. But they, but they have no concern to be committed to His cause. And many come to church just long enough to give Him a little, a little kiss on the cheek. Maybe just to get enough religion to ease their conscience that everything was okay. But they don't want to follow Him. They don't want to live where He lives and go where He goes. And I'm going to tell you, friends, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where the chaff is separated from the wheat. As someone said, it's not just a profession of faith, it's a possession of faith. Amen. And Orpah is the unsounding, eternal person who represents untold millions who have went out into eternity without Christ. Oh my goodness, and you know what adds to Orpah's guilt at the great white throne judgment? When Orpah is called up to stand before Jesus, you know what's going to add to her guilt? It's because God in His grace of all the women in wicked Moab, she was graced by God to be put into a family at least that could have led her to the true and living God. Yeah. 
Let me tell you something. People that were born and raised in the United States of America, hell will be twice as hot for them as it will China. Did you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because in America, you still have Bibles and churches and Christians and freedom. You have witnesses and influences. The more light, the greater the <coughs> condemnation. <coughs> Aren't some of you here today, before I close, glad that God put somebody in your life that influenced you to the Lord? Yeah. Aren't you glad God brought you up at least in a household where at least one parent cared about your soul and destiny. Aren't you glad for that? I told you, you know, I wasn't born and raised. I didn't have perfect parents, a perfect church, a perfect childhood. But I want to tell you something. I'm, I'm grateful that I was carried to the house of God to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And as a result of my dad, my dad made a big decision one time. I know I'm, I'm holding up great women, but my dad made a big decision. My dad made a parental decision. I don't know how much he wrestled with that. We've never talked about it. And as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't matter. But my dad made a decision that I feel like changed my life from here to eternity. My dad made a decision to leave his home church where he was practically born and raised and, and every kin folk we had, it, it, right? You know, at least on that side of the family. But dad saw what had, you know, the state of the church had just become just flatline. Amen. And I don't know how much my dad wrestled with that, but my dad, and I don't even know if he took any criticism because of it, but I will tell you what, when God took me out of that, he happened to put us in a church at that time where the Spirit was really moving. I rededicated my life. God called me to preach. And not only the blessing of that, but I met Daphne, who wasn't a Christian, and I was able to witness to Daphne and Daphne got saved at the very church that I rededicated my life and God called me to preach at and we got married in that church. Amen. And I will tell, I, you know, I, I was talking to a young preacher the other day and I felt sorry for him and he's got a good wife and they got children but his wife was struggling with his call to preach. Especially if he didn't hint it at the word pastor, she was against it. Mm -hmm. And we, were, we had lunch together and I said, brother, I said, here's what I'm going to pray for your wife. I said, my wife, has the Ruth spirit. Daphne's a perfect preacher's wife. I mean, if, if God moved me from this church here, I'll go where you go. Your God's my God. You're like, you know that she's had the Ruth spirit. And, and, and I, God put her in my life for that very reason. Mm -hmm. And I thank God for her. And man, she's seen some stuff, you know, when everybody else had, you know, two parents out here, a lot of them with kids. She's out here wrestling two kids, you know. She didn't have a lot of privileges, so I'm singing her praise this morning. But she has a root spirit. And I appreciate that. So what I'm saying is, is I'm thankful, and you can be thankful, and you have blessings, and you have people in your life that make big decisions, and that, that maybe change your life, and you ought to thank God for that. Amen? Amen. And you know what? Maybe there's young. There's a lot of young parents today that need to make some critical spiritual decisions. And may God lead them in that direction. And you know, as, as I close this morning, I will thank you for your patience. But I'm going to ask you this morning, you know, before we close with a word of invitation. You know, let's, let's, let, let's be warned by Elimelech. You know, and we're going to face some difficulties. But let's don't do anything radical. You know, fear will make you make some crazy choices. So we're not going to panic. You know, you know I'm, I'm going to tell you something. Get practical just a little bit. One of the best things we did a few days ago, we, bought, we invested and took our money. We, got, we bought some new patio furniture for a back patio. Man. We're just, we're luxury. <laughs> luxury. But I would pay $3,000 for it because we've been sitting out there and the TV's off. Glory to God. <laughs> I didn't realize how backslidden we were until we turned the TV off. This world will make you make choices as a limelight did. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Be careful.
Be careful about allowing what people say and do to make you bitter and hard inside. And you start losing your passion and compassion for people to come to know Christ. And maybe this morning, maybe God's Word will lead, lead, lead you to just say, Lord, I've got a nephew, I've got a niece, I've got, I got a cousin I, who, who just, I know they've never made a profession of faith in Christ. And maybe God will stir you up again to get concerned about them and get your thoughts off of the things of this world and get them on somebody's salvation. Yeah. Let me tell you something, new life. We'll go through dry spells as a church, but I'm going to tell you something. If we ever lose sight of the kids in this building and their soul and their salvation, we're in trouble. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of churches that's lost their spiritual power because they've let conflict in the church just ruin them, make them mad, make them bitter. It ain't worth it. No. It ain't worth it. Amen? Amen. I wish I could preach the rest of it, but I will tell you, I will tell you the hero is a man named Boaz and Ruth's was able to remarry and found her a man of God. It's just a beautiful story. Read it when you get home this week. But I want to challenge you this morning. You that made a commitment to Christ. Maybe you're here and you've never made a commitment to Christ. And you need today, you need to find your place and you say, you know what? I have decided to follow Jesus. And as the old song, where He leads me, I will follow. And you turn your back on this world and turn it towards heaven this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen.